salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Uh, we'll just stop reading there. That's Psalm 51. In, uh, in my Bible, it has an introduction to the chapter uh, saying that uh, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he'd gone in to Bathsheba. You probably know the story of David, how uh, he was tempted, uh, lust of the flesh, and uh, went to Bathsheba and sinned with her physically. And as a result of that sin, he then lied, and he even was part of a, of a murder, really. It was a terrible thing in his life, and it, it caused great trouble in, in his life then and, and even later. And uh, the prophet came to him, Nathan came to him, and shared a story with him. Uh, he, he told a story about a, a rich man and a poor man who were neighbors, and the rich man had many sheep, and the poor man had only one, and that sheep was his pet. Slept in the house, it was, it was their pet, they loved it. And when the rich man had visitors that came to visit, he stole that poor man's sheep and killed it and, and fed it to his visitors. Well, David was incensed. He said, that man's got to be punished. And Nathan pointed his finger at him and he said, David, thou art the man. Because that's exactly what David had done with another man's wife. And you know, God used that to, uh, to change David's heart. And he repented. And he confessed his sin. And, and this chapter, and, and Psalm 32 as well, uh, has to do with his, his repentant heart and his attitude towards God. You know, one of the things you see when you see an incident like that in someone else's life or even in your own life is the awfulness of sin. There are just some awful situations. Just in our own community here, it just breaks your heart. Some of these homes, you go there and you think, how can people live like this? And it's the awfulness of sin that causes us to, to live like that. He uses several different words here in Psalm 51 for sin. Now, the first one that we come across is at the end of verse 1. It's the word transgression. It, it's, a, it's like the word we use, trespass. You ever seen a sign, no trespassing? Well, a transgression is when you see the sign and you do it anyway. You say, oh, I'm going through here. Uh, it, it has to do with our action. It has to do with our rebellion in our, in our heart. He then uses the word in verse 2, iniquity. Iniquity is another word for sin. It means lawlessness. It has to do with their attitude. It's just the perverse, depraved attitude that I'll do what I want to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And then he uses, of course, the word sin. Um, the, our, our disobedience, our, our offense. It has to do with our character, really. Uh, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Uh, it's habitual wrong. Uh, God talks about it in the New Testament in Romans 3.23 when he says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It means we miss the mark. It's just our, our, the, the way we are. We're, we're not God. Uh, sin is, is a terrible thing. And as he describes it here in Psalm 51... One of the first things you, you see about sin is that it, it dirties us. His cry to God is, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, blot out that transgression. Lord, cleanse me and help me. Wash me. Because that's what sin does to us. You know, we try and cover it up. Uh, maybe you've been going through your day and had somebody say, oh, you got some dirt on your cheek there. You know, there there's a lot of dirt on us we don't see physically. But, you know, spiritually, there, there's just a lot of filth that, if we're not right with God, is, is going to hinder us and is going to make us dirty before God and before man. Many times others can see the sin in our life th that we just ignore. Uh, he says, Lord, uh, blot it out, wash me, cleanse me. And our sin is not just some general idea. Sin is very specific. Did you notice in, in verse 3, he said, I acknowledge 
my transgressions, my sin. He knew it was his sin. And he knew that it was a sin against God. You see, sin is very specific. It's not just a general thing that's in the air somehow. Um, my sin, I, I've done this thing, and I've done it against God. Verse 4, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Have you ever realized that if there was no God, there'd be no sin? The reason there's sin is because there's a holy God who has a standard. If there was no God, we could do what we wanted. Uh, listen, the hypocrisy of evolution is all around us. They've got all kinds of rules that they want us to follow because they have, uh, God has just put something in our hearts that makes us different than this chair or, or the dog across the street. And we need to understand, sin is against God, and sin is done by us. It's very specific. And, and there in verse 4, he, he makes a strange statement in a, in a way. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Now he's talking to God. <laughs> and when you read it, you think, what's he talking about there? God doesn't have to be justified. There's nothing wrong with God. What he's saying there is, God, I'm not blaming you. And you know, that's really important about sin. Your sin and my sin is not God's fault. You know, I've heard people say, well, pastor, you know, I've got red hair, so that's just, that's just the way I am. <laughs> you know, the, the world does that with all kinds of inclinations we have. Well, that's just, that's just the, way, that's the way God made me. I had a guy who was under conviction about his smoking. And we were talking about it later, and he said, well, you know, I asked God to take it away from me. He didn't. So that was God's fault. <laughs> Folks, that, that's what he's talking about there. Listen, your sin and my sin, it's not God's fault. God is holy, and God is gracious, and God will, will help us. Uh, well, if we want to blame anybody, verse 5, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. You know, the main thing we pass on to our children is our sin nature. You have to laugh sometimes. You know, a little baby's born. This little pink blob of a thing looks like nothing. And they'll say, looks just like his mother. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you can see that. Uh, but you know, the way we look like our, our parents is we're sinners just like them. And praise God if your parents were saved sinners. Sinners saved by grace who pointed you to Christ. Because they, they understand your sin nature, but they also understand that there's a Savior who can help you. Uh, we, we inherit our sin nature. And, uh, you know, there's, there's things we want to teach our children. There's things we don't have to teach our children. We don't have to teach them how to sin. And, you know, you've, you've experienced that sin is very contrary. Verse 6, he says, Thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You, you've struggled with it. I have, too. Things where, you know, there's just that, that conflict. Wanting to do right and wanting to do wrong. You know, Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 7. You know, things I would, uh, I, I find hard. And, uh, you know, there, there's just a, a real conflict with sin. An inner conflict that's only won when we surrender. That's the only way to win the conflict with sin. It, it's amazing how we'll hurt ourselves by not admitting the truth. A good example, and some, some of this material, of course, is, is from, from other people and other places, but uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, but it's the account of Naaman, who was the leader of the Syrian army. They, they were basically the power of the area at that time, and uh, he, he became a leper. Powerful man, important man, a leper. Well, one of his slaves that he'd they'd taken from Israel, it was a little Jewish girl, and she said, well, there's a man in Israel, Elisha, he could heal you. And so he went to Israel, to Elisha. And, you know, if you know the story, Elisha didn't even come out. Elisha sent his servant out and said, go dip in the Jordan seven times, you'll be right. Well, that insulted Naaman. He's an important man. And uh, he, he was going to go off. Now, now, stop and think about this a minute. Here's a man who's a leper. I mean, do you know anything about leprosy? The, the thing I know is you lose fingers, you lose your ears, your nose. I mean, you, you can't be around anybody. It's a terrible disease. The, the, in the Bible, leprosy is a very accurate picture of sin. So here's this man. He's a leper. And, and because his feelings are hurt, he's going to walk off and, and stay a leper. Now, that makes about as much sense as people rejecting Jesus Christ. 
we'll say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to humble myself. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm okay. You ask people. I ask people all the time. You think you go to heaven? Yeah, I've been good. <laughs> we're so foolish. We don't deal with the truth. The truth is we're sinners, and sin is very contrary. Now, we might excuse it, and we might try to overlook it, but it, it, it'll kill us in the end. Uh, sin separates. We read verse 11 Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, this is not a, a New Testament truth. This is an Old Testament truth. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit used to come and go on people's lives. In the New Testament, he takes up residence permanently. permanently. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. But yeah, he's talking about how sin separates us from God. And as Christians, God doesn't leave us when we sin, but it, it puts a barrier that until we deal with, uh, we're going to have problems. But you know, most importantly, our people who've never trusted Christ, that sin is a barrier for eternity. Uh, Psalm 66, uh, verse 18, there's, there's some well-known verses on this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Listen, if there's sin in my life, the first thing I need to talk to the Lord about is that sin. God says, confess it and forsake it. Uh, Romans chapter 3 says the wages of sin is death. For a lost person, sin undealt with will separate them from God for eternity. We see the awfulness of sin. Sin is, it, it's a killer. It, it's, it's the reason we have police. And even the police sometimes are, are not straight and honest and just talking to the kids this morning about things they could do, and one of them said, ah, maybe I could be a policeman. Said, yeah, but you, got, you have to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's, it, we're just prone to sin, and sin is awful. It'll tear up your home. It'll tear up your life. Uh, it, it'll, whole nations are ruined by sin, and we're on the path uh, as a nation. But you know, the thing that it helped me is, as I contemplated this chapter this week. Sin is awful, but let me tell you, God is awesome. <laughs> God is awesome. Uh, unfortunately, the world uses that word now for anything. They don't, awesome is, uh, there's not much in life that is awesome, but God is. And David knows he's able to go to God for forgiveness and for all the help he needs. And David understands that truth. You know, he starts off, have mercy upon me, O God. Why would he say that? Because he knows that God is a God of mercy. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. See, he knows what God is like. And he's been messing around with sin, and he's been getting the results, and he's seeing how awful sin was, but he knows God is loving, and he knows God is merciful. And he knows he's able to come to God and to have the remedy that he needs for his sin. Many of you would know the 23rd Psalm where God says at the end, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy will follow me. Why? Because that's what our God is. That's who our God is. God is awesome. He's full of goodness and, and mercy. In Psalm 36, there's several verses, starting in verse 5, he says, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are great, deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Our God is, is full of, of loving kindness. In the, in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, it describes God as God is love. We've known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. We love him because he first loved us. David knew he could come to this awesome God and receive loving kindness. You know, as I thought about this verse, the thing that impressed me was 
we get mercy because of his loving kindness. And his loving kindness is, he describes it as a multitude of thy tender mercies. God's, God's mercy is abundant. God has a multitude of mercies. Uh, we sang the, the song this morning, uh, My sins there are many, his mercy is more. I remember a song in my youth that some people used to sing, When I deserve justice, he gave me mercy. Aren't you glad God is merciful? You can count on God being merciful. God is, is not wanting to, to punish us. God is wanting to forgive us. That's his heart. We have a multitude. You are never beyond God's mercy in this life. I mean, there's some vile people. But let me tell you, God's mercy is more than, than their wickedness. And he doesn't just have an abundance abundance of mercy. He has tender mercies. God's mercies are not hard. God's mercies are tender. He's full of, of compassion. We learn the verse in Lamentations where he talks about his, his compassions are they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In, uh, some of you know we, we have children in, in our home now. And it's reminded it's reminded me of the mercy of God as I look into their little faces. And, you know, sometimes they, uh, they say no. Sometimes they don't want to do what they should do. But I don't hurt them. I don't do something to them. You just go on. You know, it, God is like that with us. Uh, there's many times when we oppose ourselves, and yet God is, is loving and kind you know, God is the one who sinned against, and yet he's the only one who can help us. I don't know if this is a good illustration or not, but it's like we slap him in the face, and he says, oh, are you, are you all right? Is, is your hand all right? God is full of mercy and compassion, a multitude, tender mercies. And the Bible says that he blots out our transgressions. That word blot out, blot means exterminates. <laughs> he exterminates our, our transgressions. It's repeated in verse 9, hide, thou, uh, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. And then it says that he washes and cleanses us. Now when you think of the vileness of sin, washing and, and cleansing something vile, it's no fun. I had a couple of the boys help me clean yesterday, and one of the jobs was cleaning the bird poo off the deck. And they, they did it. Um, that's, that's no fun. Listen, that's nothing compared to our sin. And yet God is willing to blot it out. God is willing to cleanse it. God is willing to, to do that for us. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I, I don't think this is accurate, but it makes me think of cleaning the carpet. You know, when there's a, a, a spot on the carpet, one of the first things you do is you blot it. Then you wash it. Now, God's blotting exterminates it, so there's, there's no, no problem. But he, he makes sure that we're, we're clean. In the New Testament, he says in 1 John, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I'm told that that word cleanseth is present continuous action. If you're saved, the blood of Christ is keeping you clean. He cleanses us. And, and he restores us. In, in verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. You know, sin will take away our joy, but God, God will restore us. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Sin will take away the, uh, the spirit that you, you need to face life. God will restore it. Verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. He'll put a song back in your heart when you're right with him. Uh, that's a blessing. Uh, God uh, blots out, washes, cleanses, restores, renews. Uh, listen, sin will keep you from being concerned for others. Sin will make you selfish. But confession will put a song back in your heart, and, and it'll give you a... a a desire to be a blessing 
a blessing to others. Sin is awful, but God is awesome. For sin abounded, grace did much more abound. My sins there are many, his mercy is more. Well, what's our part in all of this? Verse 3, the Bible says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. We have to acknowledge our sin. You know, when, when David was confronted with his sin, he admitted it. David, thou art the man. And, and David had to repent. David had to understand the, the truth of the matter. You, you know, in the Bible, David is called a man after God's own heart. You stop and think about the life of David. He did some pretty bad things. But he's called a man after God's own heart, Acts 13, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, why? Because he had a heart that would repent. He had a heart that would confess his sin. He certainly wasn't sinless, but he wanted to be right with God. He acknowledged his sin, and he, he was willing to live for the truth. In verse 4, he understood, against thee and thee only have I sinned. You know, sin is very deceptive. Um, it, 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 we, we can trick ourselves. We can, we can try and, and, and trick others. We often ignore our own sin. We deny our sin. We excuse our sin. We redefine sin. <laughs> we flaunt it sometimes. And all to deny the truth that we're sinners. In 1 John, <clears throat> I mentioned verse 7, verse 8, he says, let's see, how does it go? If, if we, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I've always found it interesting that Verses 8, 9, and 10, it's sin, sins, sinned. And it's a good way to remember it. But sin has to do with our sin nature. If you think you're not, you have no sin nature to deal with, you're living in la-la land. Yeah, that, that's just, you're deceiving yourself. The truth is not in you. Verse 10, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You, you think you've never sinned, listen, you're calling God a liar. God says all have sinned. Sin is very deceptive, but we have to recognize the truth, uh, that there is sin and that we are sinners. In Proverbs, he says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. We need to understand the truth uh, of our sin. Uh, we need to recognize the truth of the Savior. And that's where David w came to. Uh, Lord, show me mercy. Lord, wash me, cleanse me. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, God's remedy is Jesus. God became a man so that he could live and die for our sins and rise from the dead in victory over sin. The blood of Jesus Christ. Probably the most famous verse in 1 John is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the blood of Jesus cleanseth us from all sin. Uh, he, Hebrews 9, he says, Without uh, the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. In Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other. None other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is God's remedy. And David, when confronted with his sin, knew that he could come to a God of mercy and a God of loving kindness and have his sin dealt with. Jesus is the only way of forgiveness. Sin is awful. It separates families. It makes nations worthless. It ruins individuals. Listen, you don't have to go very far in, in Stafford. You'll see somebody that has let sin ruin them. Sin is awful, but God is awesome. He looks beyond our sin, and, and he sees us, and he loves us. That, that's just an, an amazing thing. He's rich in mercy. His mercy is abundant and tender for you. Not just for somebody else. I was thinking about it this morning. We kind of value people, don't we? You know, they're smart, important people. Oh, they've they're got a lot of value. There's people that maybe they're not as smart. Maybe there's something wrong with them. You know what? Every person is just as important to God as, as any other person. And, and wherever you think you fit in the world's ideas of things, listen, God loves you. 
God has tender mercy for you, just as much for you as for me or for anybody else. He's, he's abundant, and he is the remedy for your sin. 2 Corinthians 5 says, He hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ became sin for us. That cleansing, he's, he's the rag that blotted out our sin. He's the one that took our sins upon himself. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, the song asks the question, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you saved? There, there needs to be a time of calling upon Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's the Savior. We're the sinners. Man, you put those two together, and glory! <laughs> you get a saved sinner on their way to heaven. And uh, someone with a purpose and a, a reason to live. And a reason to live for eternity. Are you saved? Make sure. If you are saved, are you right with God? Are you excusing your sin or uh, letting sin keep you from the joy that, that God wants you to have? Listen, God is, he has a multitude of mercy. Tender mercy. Because of his loving kindness. And it's directed straight to you. Uh, we're going to go to him in, in prayer this morning. Uh, listen, this is a subject that we all have to deal with regularly. And uh, I'm sure that each one of us has things that we need to uh, do business with the Lord about when it comes to sin. Let me encourage you to go to the Lord in prayer right now. And uh, let's talk to him about uh, our hearts. Father, please help us. Thank you for your goodness. And Lord, your promise of, of forgiveness, if we'll, if we'll confess. Lord, that your blood is sufficient. That your grace is sufficient. Lord, I, I pray if there are any here this morning that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would help them to trust you. Lord, I pray for those that are bound by sin. Help them to come to you for freedom, for release. God, I pray for Stafford. I, I pray for Australia. God, help us to turn to you. Lord, thank you for godly men who are preaching this morning and churches all, all over. Lord, that the world would, would hear and, and respond. But help us this morning, Lord, to respond to this message. Lord, I pray for Christians. Help us to uh, keep short books with you that we might uh, not... I walk with our sin, but that we walk with you. Thank you for your goodness. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.